Okay, I'm joined today by Colonel Douglas McGregor. We're going to be talking about the Russia-Ukraine uh, war. We're going to be talking about Putin, what's going on in the Black Sea and the United States. Colonel, thank you so much for joining me today. Sure. So uh, question for you. You know, you and I have gotten some, some pushback for trying to be honest about the strength of the Russian army, the strength of the Ukrainian army. But I'm starting to see more and more, even left-leaning media like the Washington Post mm -hmm. and the New York Times, they're starting to say things about the, the actual conditions of Ukraine, the casualties. Um, are, is this a turning point where the media is now starting to shift the narrative of the American people by, by speaking in reality of what's really going on over in Eastern Europe? Well, you just asked a very important question. And at this point, we can only speculate, but uh, we do see a lot of evidence. And this was one of the reasons that I wrote the op-ed that I did in the new, uh, in the American conservative and call it the gathering storm. As I see a lot of evidence that inside the administration, some key figures have said, look, this is all going south. Ukraine is going to collapse. Uh, we've handled this badly. We need to get out. We need to find a way to distance ourselves from it. So I think the word has gone out to the media to gradually uh, break the news to the American people. And I think this is going to happen in Europe as well, that things have not gone well, that Ukraine is not going to win and that we are not going to perpetually support this proxy war against Russia. So I think that's true. And if you look specifically over the last 48 hours in the New York Times and the Washington Post, they're saying things that I and, and others have said for months, Ukrainians are being horrifically slaughtered. You know, the exchange rates between the Russians and the Ukrainians have varied from about, for every one Russian killed, you've had anywhere to, from nine to 10 Ukrainians killed, and it, it dropped for a while down to seven and eight, and then one to five, and now it's back up again at about one to eight or one to nine. You can't fight and win a war that way. And the manpower situation in that country is so ter so terrible that they've got gangs of people running around, sort of arresting people on the streets. In Odessa, I've been sent a video of uh, Ukrainian men uh, that were in a cafe. Some of them are boys. Some of them are older, uh, over the age of 40. And they're just being picked up at gunpoint, dragged out of cafes, restaurants, bars, anywhere they can find them, and pushed into vans and said, you're going to the front. Some, if they're lucky, get two or three weeks of uh, training, which is obviously inadequate. And most of the people with combat experience who, who could do well under certain circumstances are either dead or wounded. So this is a losing proposition, and Zelensky is just herding people into Russian gunfire. It, it's, very, it's very similar to the situation on the Eastern Front uh, between the Russians and the Germans. This is what uh, Stalin did. He herded millions of his countrymen into German gunfire to overwhelm them. Uh, it was terrible. And we now know that perhaps between 37 and 42 million uh, Soviet citizens were killed during the Second World War. Uh, that, When you compare that with 3 million Germans on the Eastern Front, uh, it's pretty horrific. Well, the difference today is that uh, Zelensky, though he may like to be Stalin, isn't he doesn't have this enormous manpower pool. He doesn't have the NKVD. He does have a secret police organization, which goes around, intimidates, bullies, threatens, imprisons, and shoots some people, but not on the scale of the NKVD. He just doesn't have those kinds of institutions at his disposal. So I think the truth is coming out. Now, the, the other thing that's happening, and this is worthy of some discussion, I think, today, is the uh, financial crisis in the United States. It's not just financial, it's also economic. And I think they're beginning to figure out that this is not going to end in a couple of months, that uh, this is not just a blip on the screen or something. This is very serious. So behind the scenes, there are some sober-minded individuals saying, look, we've got to turn the page on the Ukraine conflict, and we've got to begin to think about how we're going to get out of the current financial mess. Yeah, okay. Um, yesterday, uh, I had L Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer on, and I asked him a question. I want to ask the same question to you. Um, you know, we had a situation where a Russian fighter jet 
uh, was given permission from high up to basically mess with um, a, a Reaper drone that went that went down. Um, and uh, now it looks like the United States has no intention of recovering that. Uh, but Russia has decided that they're going to recover that. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think Russia went after that? And then after that, uh, we have Senator Lindsey Graham of the Republican Party in South Carolina saying it's now time for the U.S. military to start shooting down Russian warplanes over international water. What are you, what are your two thoughts on that? Let's start with the first question. Uh, and again, I I have to uh, provide you what I have been told by my friends who are on the inside of the Department of Defense. First of all, every nation has what we call the air. Uh, air Defense Identification Zone, and ADIS. Ours reaches out hundreds of miles into the Pacific, surrounds Alaska. Uh, everybody's got one. Some are larger than others. The Russians have an ADIS, an Air, air Defense Identification Zone, it reaches out into the Black Sea. Now, when you move into the ADIS, you're obligated to inform the host country that you are there. Simply come up and say, this is so-and-so. I'm here and this is what I'm doing. Obviously, we didn't do that. Secondly, uh, and, and by the way, that's what happened with the Global Hawk that we were flying through the Persian Gulf. We were right on the edge of the air defense identification zone. And it was a military reconnaissance aircraft. And under international law, since that aircraft did not identify itself, you could legally shoot it down. And that's what the Iranians did. They were actually within the in the limits of international law. Now, we did something else, though, that's very important. We turned off the transponder on this aircraft. In the Black but, Sea? Yeah, yeah, okay. on the on the MQ-29. We turned it off. I don't know at what altitude it was, whether it was at 10,000 or 5,000 feet. I have no idea. But if you turn off the transponder and you fly into the air defense identification zone, the assumption is your, your intentions are not... Uh, friendly, that, that this is a hostile intervention in the air. And this was a reconnaissance platform. It flew very close to Crimea, where there are Russian military installations. It was obviously trying to collect data that could be converted to targeting data for Russian facilities in, Crim in Crimea. So bottom line is they were within their rights to shoot it down. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've soft peddled this. We don't have a leg to stand on unless we want to risk war with Russia. Now, how it was removed or, or defeated, I've heard all sorts of discussions. They released fuel on it. The fuel went into the intakes. The aircraft crashed. Okay, I don't know. doesn't matter how they did it. But there were, the reasons were, as I stated. Now, as far as the uh, expressions of great courage by uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, the combat veteran uh, attorney at law in the Staff Judge Advocates Corps, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tired of him. Uh, and I think most Americans are beginning to sober up and figure out that this man is, quote unquote, not channeling Ronald Reagan, as he claimed when he said, well, if Reagan were president, he'd shut it down. First of all, that's nonsense. Reagan and his administration, they were not incautious people. They moved very deliberately and they were very cautious vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. Secondly, I think he's channeling the Three Stooges because what he's suggesting is that we should then challenge the Russian military establishment and its control of the airspace over the Black Sea. That would be like flying into the Caribbean just off the coast of Florida and telling the Americans, if you try to interfere with me, well, then we're going to shoot you down. It's absurd. It's nonsensical. It's a disaster waiting to happen. People like this, to be blunt, should be removed from office. They present a clear and present danger to the American people. Yeah. Yeah, he uh, he seems to think that you can just call for regime regime change whenever you want. That uh, as as we spoke in our last interview, you said that uh, politicians take comfort in hiding behind the military. I think he takes great comfort in in uh, hiding behind the military. Um, speaking of the military, uh, I, I watched uh, a joint conference with General Milley and Lloyd Austin. Uh, in there, Lloyd Austin says, Russia is preparing for a massive attack this coming spring once the mud season dries out, and that the United States and NATO nations 
need to be ready to rush weapons to Ukraine so that they can continue to beat back Putin and the Russian army. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the first comment is you don't build armies on the fly. Can't be done. Uh, what you had at the beginning was an army of about 450,000 regular standing professional force, which was pretty good, by the way. It was well-equipped, probably better equipped than almost any NATO army. You had another 200,000 reserves, uh, reservists who were trained that could be mobilized and thrown into the field, which is what happened. So you could have a force of 650,000. That's what the force of 190,000 Russians ultimately encountered when they went into eastern Ukraine. Now, that force is largely annihilated. It went away months ago. And some people think that they've literally rebuilt the Ukrainian army three times. In other words, they've forced mobilizations, integrated new people, re-equipped, sent back into action. What Austin is really saying is we're going to do that a fourth time. Uh, that's not going to happen, uh, first of all. That's delusional. Secondly, again, you don't formations take time to build. Armies are not about individuals. When you see numbers, those are very misleading. It's not how many individual soldiers you can put into the field. It has to do with how many formations. And those formations can be either battalions or brigade groups. And that's what the Ukrainians use. The Russians are largely organized into what I would call brigade groups. 5,000 men. The largest formation in the Russian army is 8,000, and that's a motorized rifle division. Well, 8,000 is, is about half the size of a U.S. division. So they have dramatically downsized maneuver units because they've understood you've got to disperse and you have to be able to be flexible with your maneuver, and respond quickly. We haven't gotten there. We've resisted all that. But the point is, we're now at the stage where that simply can't be done quickly. So the notion that you can rush equipment in, people can pick it up, form on it, go into action is absurd. I'm being told that, you know, these Leopard 2 tanks that are supposed to be delivered, maybe they're being delivered now, I don't know, by Germany, that if they're going to use them, the crews are going to have to be German or Polish uh, because the Ukrainians can't train quickly enough to employ them effectively. So it's just as we have two Ukrainian pilots training in the United States ostensibly for the purpose of flying F-16s. It's ludicrous nonsense. It can't be done. It won't work. So I think the game is just about up. And whatever Austin says uh, is designed to put a happy face on the dead rat. And I think last night, Tucker Carlson made the point that looking into uh, Millie's face, he saw a great deal of fear. And I think that's probably true because I know that behind the scenes, at least on one occasion, maybe more, Millie actually told the truth and made it clear that this is back in December. Ukrainians have done just about as much as they can do. We ought to negotiate. And of course, he was slammed for that. And he got, quote unquote, back on the team. And he's been lying prolifically ever since. But the lies are wearing thin now. Oh, okay. Um, you you called uh, the fact that uh, Bakhmut would become basically a meat grinder. Um, you know, I, I know you probably don't take comfort in being right about things like that, especially with human casualty. And the Ukrainian people have fought so hard. Um, and so has the Wegner group. But uh, do you think it's now time for them to concede the area, fall back, regroup, build up ammunition and artillery for a few days, and then try and dig in and hold the line again? Or is, is it just at this point, it, it, they're just going to continue to throw bodies at the meat grinder? Well, Bakhmut will go down in history as having been the graveyard of the Ukrainian military. That's how terrible it's been. The losses are frightening. The Ukrainians will insist, well, we've killed some Russians. Yes, that's when the exchange rate changed from one to eight or nine down to one to five. So the Russians have taken some losses. But you're now comparing 30,000 dead Russians and perhaps 60, 70,000 wounded Russians with potentially up to 250,000 dead Ukrainians, plus another three or 400,000 wounded. And most of those wounded will never return to active duty. They were so severely wounded that they can't fight again. Now, this is not unprecedented. We, we've seen these kinds of things. During World War I, 
in 110 days of fighting, because that's all that we did in World War I in 1918. We fought for 110 days. And in that time frame, we lost 318,000 men, casualties, of which 110,000 were killed. That means that in roughly every battle, we lost 1,000 dead. That's the kind of thing that's been going on in Ukraine. So it's not unprecedented, but you can't keep that up. We came into World War I at the end of the war. The, the French, the British, the Russians had lost millions of people. Uh, and Germany was ultimately overwhelmed simply by numbers and materiel and thanks to the Royal Navy starvation. This is a different situation right now. Ukraine has never had those numbers at all. And they are now really on their last legs. There's no question about it. We keep pushing them to stay in the fight. Now, we have advised them on occasion to pull back, regroup, a new defensive line, build up your reserves. Zelensky, I think, has chosen to ignore that advice in favor of continuing to attack, attack, attack on the assumption that if he can gain any ground, if he can prove that the Ukrainians have any fight left in them, and the Ukrainian soldiers are excellent, that's not the question, but no human being can put up with this the way they have in Bakhmut that somehow or another we will all rush and, and support them. And then I think there's the other aspect of this. I think he has hoped against hope that he could drag us in. And I think we've actually conveyed the impression to him that that might happen. That's a terrible thing to say. It's a, it's a lie. We were never going to involve ourselves directly in a confrontation with Russia. Now, there were times when we flirted with it. This is this coalition of the willing. But my understanding is that's largely gone away now. And there's been a much more sober-minded assessment. We realize we can't go into this. You know, our war stocks are exhausted. We, we've emptied them. The Europeans never had large ones to begin with because they've been essentially vassal states of the greater American empire now for decades. And they assumed that we would come in and fight for them. So there's not much left. Russia is just at the peak of its power right now. It's mobilized. It's got unending quantities of ammunition and equipment. It's ready to fight. So the notion that we're going to motor into Western Ukraine and challenge them is a lot of nonsense. I think that's finally sunk in. That's why I think there's a movement now to try and figure out how do we disengage without looking ridiculous. That's going to be pretty tough because we, we lied to the Ukrainians. We've lied to our own population. We've lied to the Europeans conveyed the impression that we could do something we can't. The Russians have not said a great deal, but they've done a lot. And a lot of us thought that they would attack in January. But the problem was they never got the, the ground freeze that they needed to support their maneuver. And again, people have to understand in that part of eastern Ukraine, the Black Earth, which is some of the most fertile uh, ground in the world. In fact, during World War II, the Germans loaded rail cars with black earth from Ukraine and shipped it back to Germany to improve their agricultural output. People don't know that. So, but this earth is about 10 to 15 deep in most case, 10 to 15 feet deep in most cases. And unless you get a freeze in the winter, you just sink into the mud. Now we're into the muddy season and the muddy season lasts potentially until May, sometimes even longer which is why most of the major offensive operations that the Soviets launched came in the summer, because by then everything was dry and you had a chance to maneuver. For, for that matter, the same thing was true for the Germans. So the bottom line is that this, this thing is over except for the, the what is it, the uh, announcement of, of reality that this cannot go on. The humane thing to do right now, which is not what we have done, is to intervene and say, that's it. Uh, we, we've got to stop this and start talking to the Russians, not demanding of the Russians what we want, but saying, look, tell us what your conditions are. Tell us what you want. And we will move to the best of our ability to meet those needs. And really, this we're back to the old story. Make Ukraine neutral. It could have been neutral from day one. We could have avoided all of this. It doesn't have to be a member of NATO. And then secondly treat the Russians that live within Ukraine's borders as equal citizens. Stop oppressing them. Stop brutalizing them. Stop treating them as third-class citizens. Equality before the law for everybody in Ukraine. 
the Ukrainians wanted to, quote unquote, forcibly Ukrainianize Russians. Give up your language, your culture, your identity, or get out. I mean, this 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 was unacceptable, and the Russians are sitting there watching this. So I don't know what happens now, but you're going to get a different territorial outcome. These borders will be adjusted, and there's not much that the Ukrainians could do. And we are not prepared to march east into eastern Ukraine with hundreds of thousands of European allies to fight this war. In the meantime, you have this economic catastrophe developing in the United States and Europe. It's not just the banking system. It's larger than that. The underlying fundamentals are terrible. I was shocked the other day when I discovered that a firm in Germany, in Saxony, which is the area that we used to call East Germany, which is real, really middle Germany historically, there's a firm there that's involved with metals, forming metals, shaping metals, developing alloys. The firm's been in business since 1380. It just went under. Oh. Why? In Germany, this is incomprehensible. Thousands of people are losing their jobs because there's no cheap energy. Cheap energy fuels everything. What do you think happened in the United States with Standard Oil and J.D. Rockefeller? That was cheap energy. That's why between the Civil War and World War I, we became an economic, scientific, industrial juggernaut. You can't sustain yourself in that category. You can't maintain your standards of living and prosperity without affordable energy. Germany's in a lot of trouble. And I don't think the Germans are very happy about it. It's going to get worse before it gets better because you just don't turn on energy and restore your prosperity. It takes time to build back. So the old build back better regime in Washington has done just about everything it can to destroy us and our European allies. Yeah, it feels like build back broker, to be honest. Um, you know, and that's what I cover on my my daily show. Um, okay, sticking with the energy topic and the financial situation, uh, do you think, I, I don't think the United States and the media is going to hold President Biden accountable for blowing up the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. They're doing everything they can to, to cover for the sitting president. But I don't know that Europe cares and they're protesting, they want answers, and they want that cheap energy, even if it's from somebody like Putin. Um, do you think that President Biden could be in trouble uh, throughout the rest of this year when it comes to the financial situation and the Nord Stream 2 uh, attack on Germany, who now you know is in desperate need of affordable energy? I think things are going to get much worse here in the United States over the next 60 days. Now, I am not a financial analyst, nor do I claim to be an economist. Of course, John Kenneth Galbraith once said that economists exist to make astrologers look professional. So I don't feel too badly about uh, making some statements, but I think as these interest rates hike, and that's what they're going to do, they're going to hike interest rates again in June, it makes it that much more difficult in the banking system where there's almost no credit at this point anyway. Uh, you, you cannot you cannot have price and and interest rate stability simultaneously under the cir current circumstances. The more you hike the interest rates, the worse the situation becomes. There's something else too. Americans don't understand very well. Washington doesn't understand at all. We are not the nation of 1991. Now, we began shipping out. When I say we, I'm talking about your ruling class of corporate bigwigs and politicians. We began shipping out our industrial base to China and elsewhere back under Ronald Reagan. Nobody ever points that out. But this, this process of sort of shipping it out for cheap labor costs started in the 80s. Today, we simply don't have the scientific industrial base that we did 30 years ago. So that if you restart the economy, if you will, there are not hundreds of thousands of jobs out there for people that are going to do them. When Franklin Roosevelt dragged us into World War II, we had vast numbers of factories. Our whole industrial base was sitting idle. But when we started the war, suddenly millions of people showed up and we went back to work because we had an industrial base. We don't have one now. That's a huge problem. This is what Donald Trump was talking about. He was trying to repatriate industries. He was trying to restart industry by focusing on 
what I would call high-end uh, manufacturing. In other words, not low-end stuff, high-end stuff. He was trying to reinvigorate agriculture, reinvigorate the energy production systems. That's what he was trying to do. That was stopped dead in its tracks. It's going to take us a decade or more to restart all of those things in the right direction. That's the problem. You have a similar problem now in a place like Germany, because Germany is really the industrial engine of Europe. There's nobody else in Europe compared with Germany in terms of its productivity and its scientific industrial capacity. These things are going to take time. I think Biden is going to end up being the scapegoat for the left. I mean, I, I call him the cardboard cutout president because I don't think he's really there. I don't think he's really in charge. I think he reads and says whatever you put in front of him. And then he saunters off, you know, to the door and walks out of the room. Others are in charge who were not elected. These are people that were either appointed or there as, as assistants or advisors or something. I don't even know who they are, but I'm sure if you go down the list to the employees in the White House and some of the people that are listed as advisors, you'll find out. But those are the people running our country, not Joseph Biden. And then you have irresponsible people like uh, Lindsey Graham and Chuck Schumer and others. They're just along for the ride. They haven't paid attention to anything. How many times have we hiked the debt ceiling? How long has this been going on? Well, it's a party. You know, why stop now? Open up another case of champagne. That's what's been going on for decades. It's all about to stop. So if you're on the left and you look at this catastrophe approaching, Russia wins in Ukraine unambiguously. The whole thing is a catastrophe. The Ukrainian nation is killed, literally destroyed. Millions have left the country. They're never going back. It's awful. I don't even want to begin to talk about the terrible ramifications for Ukrainians because people mistake something. They say, well, you're you're a Putin agent because, of, no, I'm not a Putin agent. I'm not necessarily pro-Russian. I'm not necessarily pro-Ukrainian. In fact, I like them both from personal experience growing up, especially with Ukrainians. It has nothing to do with it. This war should not have happened. We could have stopped it in its tracks in the first week. We could have prevented it from ever happening if we had simply listened to Moscow and what they wanted, which was no NATO nation on their borders. Specifically, they didn't want a NATO army and they didn't want U.S. missiles sitting in eastern Ukraine aimed at their cities and their uh, nuclear deterrent. All of this was avoidable. So we brought all of this on. We forced this to happen. So what do you do? You look at Biden, you say, well, it's his fault. He becomes the scapegoat for everything. And he's he's resigning. And we have a wonderful opportunity. We'll have the first non-white woman as president of the United States. Isn't that wonderful? Really? Well, we'll see what happens with that. I mean, we're, we're in new territory now. This is, Steve, this is a world we've never seen before. We're watching this entire structure of power that has been built up over decades fall apart. We could have managed all of this differently. We put everything at risk. We're going to watch NATO sort of gradually die alone in the corner. You know, Henry James said, sacred cows are never slain. They simply vanish. Our sacred cows are going to vanish. No one's going to stand up and say, oh, well, today we, we bury NATO. Today we bury this or that or the next thing. No, it'll just drift away. And we're going to drift away out of Europe, out of Ukraine. We're going to drift away from lots of places because we're bankrupt. That's the sad truth. And no one should be surprised. And I think when the Americans wake up some morning over the next 90 days, they're going to be furious. And I think the first step will be, well, we'll blame it on Joe Biden. He's the scapegoat. Then it's the Wild West. Okay. Wow, thank you. This has been very, very insightful. Um, and I, I believe the, the viewers will uh, really enjoy this. Um, one, last, one last question, then I'll let you go. I appreciate your time. You mentioned that the humane thing would be for the United States to step in and say, this war is over, let's be done. Don't you feel like China is trying to fill, fill that vacuum where they're now saying, oh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, there's a lot of money to be made. Let, let's broker peace. Russia, Ukraine, hey, the United States is not going to step in. 
we are going to step in and, and broker peace. Is, is this one more way for China to try to uh, eclipse the United States on the world stage? Well, first of all, I do not subscribe to the view that China wants to eclipse us. They know they can't. They have serious problems internally as well. The biggest problem China has always faced throughout most of its history is it's too big to do much more than it's already done. They have 1.4 billion people. Every day Xi wakes up and is trying to figure out, how do I hold this place together? How do I stop it from falling apart? I'm serious. Yeah. China is not some sort of martial state that wants desperately to go to war anywhere. On the contrary, they fear it. They don't want it. Now, when you look at Ukraine, Ukraine sits astride all of the routes, all of the railroads, and everything that comes out of Central Asia and China into Europe. China has been trying to build this thing they call One Belt, One Road. Essentially, they want to restore the commerce lines that existed under the Mongols after the Mongols conquered China between China, Japan, Korea, and Southeast Asia, and Europe. You go right across the center of Central Asia with your rail lines. This war has to stop if that's going to happen. The Chinese desperately want this war over because they want to build those lines. We want to stop that commerce. Well, that's right up there in the, in the category of let's stop Niagara Falls. How do you stop Europe and Northeast Asia from trading with each other? If you look at Europe, Russia and Europe and on one side, on the Western side, and you can add North America with this, and then on the other side, Northeast Asia. Those are the two poles of scientific industrial power and production on the planet. If those two poles go to war, the world is lost. The rest of the world desperately needs both of us. So no, the Chinese are not looking for war, and they're not necessarily interested in displacing us. They're trying to build their commercial economic empire, if you will. And the Russians have a critical role in all of this because the Russians are the muscle in Central Asia. They provide security for those lines of com communication, for the rail lines. No one in Central Asia trusts the Chinese. No one in Asia beyond China's borders trusts the Chinese. <laughs> People are not stupid, but they're not afraid of an invasion, not a military invasion. But they're all very, very concerned about the Chinese. You know, whenever I've gone over on business in Northeast Asia, where I talk to my friends that are in Korea or Japan, they always laugh and say the same thing. You Americans are stupid. Do you see any Chinese in our laboratories, in our universities? Of course not. The Chinese do what they've always done. If you leave it on the table, they'll steal it. That's what they do. They've been doing it for thousands of years. Everyone in Asia knows everyone else. We're the ones that don't know anything because we sit back from the rest of the world convinced that we have all the answers. We're the shining city on the hill. Everybody needs to emulate us. And by the way, if you don't, we club you over the head either with our control of the financial system and the dollar or our military establishment. Well, the world is saying, no thanks. We've had enough of this. We need to be part of the world, but we don't have to bully it. And that's what we've got to come to terms with. So people like Lindsey Graham and Schumer and the rest of these people need to shut up. We don't need to bully anybody. When you bully the rest of the world, you end up in a position we are in now. We're being increasingly isolated by our own stupidity. All we need to do is stop it. We need to be prepared to do business with everybody and stop dictating to everyone everywhere how they will govern themselves. And if we have a dispute of some kind with what someone else somewhere wants to do internally, we, we can deal with that privately. You know, we don't have to deal with it in public and we can make our views known. And that frequently has more effect than publicly humiliating your business partner. So all this sort of arrogance and hubris needs to go away. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor. We value your opinion. We value your time. Thank you for being on today's show. Thank you, Steve.